Today is Tuesday, September 11th, 2018. This is an interview with Dr. Sig Hecker, conducted as part of the American Institute of Mining, Metallurgical, and Petroleum Engineers Oral Histories Project. The interviewer is Tom Nazalik, and the location is Sig's office at the Los Alamos National Laboratory here in New Mexico. Sig is a Senior Fellow Emeritus of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. He is Director Emeritus of Los Alamos National Laboratory and the recipient of a remarkable number of awards and honors. Sig, due to time constraints, I won't be able to do you justice, but for just to give our audience a sense, you are a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a foreign member of both the Russian Academy of Sciences and the India Institute of Metals, fellow of APS, TMS, ASM, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and honorary member of ACS. That was naturally a partial list, but by any accounts, it's clear that you have a remarkable career. I'm very pleased to be here today to interview you. I hope that we'll cover your early career time, both as a postdoc at Lanell and at GM, before returning back to Lanell, where you spent most of your career. And of course, you're now at Stanford. I also want to cover your outlook on the engineering profession. But perhaps to start off, Sig, can you describe any of your experiences during your formative years that led you to embark on this career, starting with your upbringing and schooling? So my upbringing, I actually, I grew up in Austria. As it turns out, uh, I was actually born in Poland uh, of Austrian parents uh, as an accident of the war. So I was born there in October 1943. Uh, my father was actually stationed uh, in the German army uh, on the Russian front, uh, and they were allowed to take women and children along. I was born there. Things got pretty rough. Women and children were kicked out of there. I was four months old uh, and eventually wound up uh, back in Austria proper. And that's where I grew up. Uh, and I went to school uh, until I was 13 years old. And during those times, uh, I don't think I had ever imagined that, first of all, I would be anywhere but Austria. <laughs> because when I was growing up, uh, we essentially, uh, my life, we lived in, in army barracks uh, that were renovated uh, with uh, no running water, uh, essentially no central heat, um, no books of any sort. So I, I didn't grow up in an environment uh, where I thought I would ever go to university. Actually, what I really liked doing when I was a kid growing up in Austria uh, was playing soccer and skiing. And so my dream you know, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, was to be a professional skier, like every other kid in Austria that grows up uh, in the mountains, which is where I grew up, in a little mountain town, about 4,800 people. Uh, and, but nevertheless, I was good in school. Uh, I really enjoyed math, I enjoyed science, uh, but then for a variety of reasons, uh, it turns out my father never came back from the Russian front, uh, and so I really, didn't know a father. My mother eventually remarried uh, and then rejoined uh, relatives who'd moved to the United States. And so I got to the United States in December 1956. So at that time I was 13 years old and I came to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, went to a public school, which wasn't much quite frankly, uh, but I was a good student. And so at that time I started thinking about uh, you know, I really should go to university, and I was the first uh, in my family to, to go to university. Uh, and so at that point, you know, being a reasonably new kid uh, in this country, having to learn how to speak English, so I thought, well, what do you want to do? <clears throat> well, this was uh, going on to 1961. Uh, the big thing was nuclear science. So I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. That's what I decided in high school I wanted to do. Uh, so I had actually, uh, the local school uh, in Cleveland was Case Tech, Case Institute of Technology. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I wouldn't go too far away. So I also looked at Carnegie Tech, which was in Pittsburgh, not too far away. Uh, 
Uh, and then probably like every foreign kid that thinks about, uh, foreign born kid that thinks about going to college in the US, I thought I should apply to Harvard. So I did apply to Harvard also. Well, anyway, uh, as things would have it, I wound up uh, staying home uh, in Cleveland. Uh, I managed to get a scholarship uh, to go to Case Tech. Uh, we didn't have any money in Cleveland either, so I couldn't have afforded to go to school without the scholarship. I still remember John Hunting scholarship. And it turns out you have to be a U.S. citizen in order to get this uh, scholarship. And so here I was in the fall of 1961 as I was about to start a case. But I hadn't been in this country five years yet, which is what it takes to get citizenship. And so the folks at the scholarship committee were kind enough to say, well, if you apply for citizenship, uh, we'll take that as the intention. They gave me the scholarship. I wound up uh, going to Case Tech. I started in, in physics because I wanted to do nuclear physics. And after a couple of years, I thought, you know, I'm, physics is fun, but I, I'm really not learning anything that would allow me to get a job after four years because I would have no intention to go past four years. You know, my family, the idea was, look, they sort of take care of you until you're 18. At 18, you go out, you're on your own. You know, you have to take care of how you're going to make a living. And I thought, well, maybe at the age of 21 or two, then I get a job. Uh, and in Cleveland, uh, most of the jobs there, particularly at the time, were sort of manufacturing automotive, steel, aluminum, uh, so one of my colleagues actually said, hey, why, why don't we go look over at the uh, metallurgy department at Case? And so we did. So I, I joined then metallurgy and materials for third and fourth year. Uh, and that's where I got uh, my BS degree at Case in 1965. Were there any teachers that stand out in your mind, teachers or classmates that influenced your decisions to pursue metallurgy over physics? Yeah, I would say probably the, the largest influence uh, was my my colleague, uh, same age, uh, a fellow by the name of Bob Smilak. Actually, he's also a card-carrying member of, of TMS. And, and so um, Bob and I got to be good buddies. It, it turns out it was an interesting background. Bob uh, went to St. Ignatius, which was a good, very, very good school, Catholic high school. I went to East High School in Cleveland. I had a minimal high school education. He had a great high school education. And so we started, so he was much better prepared than I was, but then we sort of leveled out. Uh, and, and he's the guy that had this influence of saying, why don't we go look at the metallurgy department? And so then we did. And there in the metallurgy department, actually I would say during undergraduate uh, years, the biggest influence, that was during the days that I would sort of call the British invasion. And this isn't just the Beatles, but you know, it was the British metallurgy and materials community came, came to the United States. Uh, and at Case, uh, we, had, we had three Brits, very young uh, British uh, faculty, actually they were British graduate, came to be faculty at, at Case. Uh, and one of them, uh, it turns out it wasn't all that much older than I was, uh, Terry Mitchell uh, uh, came from the UK. Uh, he was a young professor at Case, and he took Bob and myself in during our senior year, and we did a senior thesis with Terry Mitchell. And we got our first uh, scientific publication in 1965 uh, because Terry Mitchell worked with us. Uh, it was called Anisotropic Pileup, uh, Dislocation Pileups uh, in Anisotropic Crystals, I should say. So and the uh, Dislocation Pileups in Anisotropic Crystals, uh, published in Physica Status Solidi in 1965. And I said, wow, you know, that's not bad. In 1965, I'm 21 years old, you know, I get a publication. And so that really helped to convince me that uh, I should go on to, to graduate school. So he had a, a substantial influence. And then later, uh, when I came back the case for graduate work, uh, my thesis advisor, uh, a professor by the name of Lynn Ebert, who was mechanical metallurgy, uh, he had an enormous influence. And, and the influence there was mostly uh, he basically said, hey, looks like I'm going to sort of get you out in the right direction. But you got to figure out what you're going to do. And so that's why I learned you really got to go on your own. You got to think things through. You got to pose the right question for what you want to do. So he had that influence. What was your PhD topic on 
So uh, what Lynn Ebert then laid out initially said, uh, look, he was interested at that time in composite materials. Uh, I was initially interested in actually working with Terry Mitchell on much more of the physics side of metallurgy, because that's what he did, you know, coming from the UK was metal physics. Uh, but Lynn Ebert was a mechanical metallurgist, and actually there, there was a strong line of mechanical metallurgy programs at, at, uh, at Case. And so he laid out uh, the general area of saying, look, fiber composites are, are just about to really come into their own in terms of applications, you know, be it aerospace, be it wherever. Uh, so why don't you do something in, uh, in fiber composites? Uh, and uh, I had an interest in, in mechanics and mechanical metallurgy. I'd taken a lot of math classes, mechanics classes. Uh, and so uh, we then sort of jointly defined an area uh, that was uh, my thesis topic, and that is to, to understand uh, the effect of multi-axial stresses in different types of composite materials. And it being a PhD thesis, uh, you had to go deep enough to try to understand the mechanics. And so I, I did a lot of development of actually somebody's plasticity theory to try to understand uh, the transition from elastic to plastic behavior in fiber composites. And then I build uh, a model composite, very, very simple composite uh, of two materials, uh, which at that time, uh, you know, I, I picked them because they had interesting mechanical properties. I, I didn't pick them that later on in my life, like in 30 or 40 years later, I'd actually come back to that because they were also important in the nuclear business, but that was totally an accident. So one of them was margin steel. And, and so what's interesting about margin steel, of course, there's a lot of fascinating metallurgy, uh, but I didn't study that metallurgy particularly, I had to understand it. So margin steel can have very high yield strength. So for example, there's something called 350 grade margin steel has yield strength of 350,000 PSI. So I wanted the steel that had a very, very high yield strength. So you had a long elastic region. Uh, and then uh, inside of a cylinder of margin steel, uh, I diffusion bonded a rod of beryllium. Now it turns out beryllium is really a peculiar material. Uh, of course, one of the things, it's toxic, so you have to worry about beryllium, how you work with beryllium. At a university environment, uh, you know, as I look back, uh, some of those practices weren't, probably weren't uh, the best in the world. Uh, but uh, we managed, I managed to diffusion bond beryllium. And the beauty about beryllium, it, it has this incredibly low Poisson's ratio. So Poisson's ratio uh, essentially tells you how much does a material contract if you pull it in tension elastically. And most materials have Poisson's ratio, you know, somewhere between 0.25 and 0.35 or so. Well, beryllium is 0.05. So it essentially means you pull it and it doesn't contract. Because the margin steel wants to contract, you set up triaxial stresses. So the idea was to set up this sort of model triaxial stress state uh, in this composite, and then go ahead and be able to predict its behavior and its transition from elastic to plastic behavior. Uh, so, so that's what I did for my thesis. And so uh, I started that in the fall uh, of 65. Uh, I finished my master's and got a master's still from Case Institute of Technology. But before I was able to finish my PhD, uh, Case Institute of Technology federated, as they called it, uh, with Western Reserve University and became Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and so, uh, and then I wound up getting my PhD one year later in 1968, uh, in, in uh, August of, of 1968. Uh, and, um, and that was uh, at that time from Case Western Reserve. And, and what that work on my, um, on my PhD thesis did has really got me intrigued uh, about the effect uh, of multi-axial stresses uh, on the deformation of elastic plastic fracture of materials. And that's when I decided, hey, look, that's what I'd like to do uh, for, uh, for either for a postdoc or, or uh, for assistant professorships. And that's when I started looking around. But, but in between, I had, I had a stint at, at Los Alamos. How did you come to Los Alamos for a postdoc after your PhD studies at Case? 
So it actually it turned out, the reason I came for the postdoc was very much so that uh, I came here as a summer student in 1965. Uh, and so, uh, you know, going back now to graduating from Case Institute of Technology, four years, and, and then there were several major changes in my life. First, I graduated. Uh, and then the second is I got married. And so I married my wife, Nina, uh, in June uh, of 1965. So I actually graduated one day got married like three days later, and then left for Los Alamos, New Mexico for a summer job the following day. And so we came here on our honeymoon in June of 1965. Uh, and, and quite frankly, so there were two reasons why I came to Los Alamos. One was, again, I was still uh, this kid, you know, that came from Austria, came to this country, I was still sort of really amazed uh, by what this country would allow uh, a foreign-born person to do. First of all, to come here, go to school, and then actually to be able to work at a place like Los Alamos. Uh, and, and the whole key to my coming to Los Alamos, first, the reason I came was one, there was the fame of Los Alamos. You know, if you think about it, this is now 1965, uh, so 20 years after the Manhattan Project. Uh, uh, so there was this incredible fame of this laboratory. But the second reason, for me was probably just as important, and that is uh, in the brochures they had in, in the administrative hall at Case, called Tomlinson Hall, they had this brochure of Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, which is what it was called at the time. Uh, and it showed, you know, some of the uh, facilities here, but the most important part, it showed a photograph of the ski area. And I said, oh my God, you know, I could go there and ski, because when I came from Austria, to Cleveland, as you might imagine, it wasn't much skiing in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, the hills were maybe 100, uh, 200 feet high. Uh, and so just that attraction, of course, I knew I couldn't ski in the summer, but the attraction of mountains, being able to get back in the mountains. So that's what, what brought uh, me to Los Alamos first. And then my wife and I, as I said, we came for our honeymoon. So that three months here uh, was really influential then, sort of in the rest of my life. Uh, first of all, that was the first time when I actually worked on plutonium. So at, at the age of 21, uh, I was in the CMR building, which is not far from this office, Chemistry Metallurgy Research Building. Uh, and, and literally within a week, uh, I was in the glove box laboratories doing roll bonding of plutonium uh, because I was, you know, uh, under uh, the strict instructions of my mentor as to how you work in a plutonium laboratory, what you do in a plutonium laboratory. And so I became fascinated by, uh, by plutonium. And so that, that helped also then later on in terms of uh, deciding uh, what, uh, what I wanted to do in life. And then the beauty uh, of this place, you know, having spent nearly three months here in the summer was great. And that was part uh, then of the important part of the decision uh, as to why it came here, he, he, uh, you know, to come uh, to Los Alamos uh, in 1968 for a postdoc. Although it was a really close race because I almost, almost came very close uh, to taking a faculty position at the University of Illinois uh, in 1968, but in the end decided to come to Los Alamos. You said you almost went to become a professor right out of graduate school. You've now returned to academia, this time as a professor at Stanford, and you teach students. How has the educational landscape changed since you were a student at Case? I know it's a very different subject area, but do you have any general remarks? So I would say generally today it's, it's so much richer uh, than it was back in, in 1965. Uh, and perhaps part of that was just because of my own limited outlook uh, on life uh, in terms of what I knew before I went to college uh, and, and so forth. So, so that, that just could be part of it. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, as I was going through case, uh, for the most part, I was just interested in, in science, mathematics, and then you know metallurgy, physics, metallurgy, uh, and all those other courses that we had to take uh, to me were mostly a nuisance. You know, why did I have to study world history uh, or the history of art and those things? I still have those textbooks. Uh, and for the most part, 
you know, I, I would say um, I didn't have uh, much appreciation uh, for that. Uh, and I look at the students today at Stanford, and, and they just have such a richer environment, uh, you know, than what I did. And so I teach classes, and when the students come to see me and ask for advice as to what to do, and so I tell them, I said, look, I go back to, to my own experience at Case, and make sure while you're there at school, get a broader education. I mean, this is the time of your life when you can do that. Uh, and so, you know, I was, I must say, pretty proud that I raced through from undergraduate school to getting a PhD in three years. Uh, and as I look back now, mm, that was not a good decision. Uh, you know, that would have been a time that I had a chance to perhaps take some courses in international relations or take some other humanities or learn something about the world or learn more about entrepreneurship. And Case was actually already starting to look at those issues as to what you do as to how you get from science to technology. Um, I didn't do uh, any of those things. And uh, I was in a hurry. It turns out by the time I left my PhD, uh, my wife and I, we had two kids already. And, and so there was this other issue that somehow I had to go and make some money, you know, more than I was able to get as a graduate student. Uh, but uh, it's just this much uh, richer environment. And at least of what I find at, at Stanford, uh, there is um, uh, this terrific interplay of, of research and teaching. Uh, and, and that makes... Uh, the, uh, the, the teaching experience for the students, a much richer experience. And at Stanford also, you have a much more of the interplay of sort of the, the rest of the world and the, the humanities and, and how they interplay with whatever your uh, interest is. Uh, that's, that's important uh, as well. So, so I think that to me, and again, this may reflect just my own limited background and upbringing, uh, is uh, we're producing much better prepared students today for that complicated world we're going to live in uh, than we produced or than that system produced when I got out. So you mentioned beryllium and margin steel and how you worked on them during your PhD. What did you do as a postdoc here at Lanel? So when I came uh, to Los Alamos uh, at that time, as I had mentioned, I was particularly interested uh, in the um, effect of multi-axial stresses uh, on material behavior. And so when, when I did um, uh, plasticity analysis uh, uh, for composites, you know, during my uh, PhD research, uh, I looked into sort of the state of the art as to how does one deal with the transition from elastic behavior, that is reversible behavior, to plastic behavior in materials, uh, and how do you describe that? Uh, so what I found, there were a couple of very simple theories, something called the von Mises uh, you know, yield criterion, for example, that students in metallurgy and mechanics learn. Uh, and, and yet, there were people doing research in several universities. I remember particularly a guy by the name of Aris Phillips at, at Yale to look at the very nature of the yield surface and to do experimental work to see whether you can map out the elastic to plastic transition under multi-axial stresses. And so uh, during the end then of my PhD work, I said, you know, this is an area that simply isn't well defined. And what it really needs is, is more experimental work. And this area, as Phillips said, essentially just about had closed up shop and there was hardly anyone in the U.S. doing yield surface uh, work. And so I said, that's what I'm going to do. And so I came uh, to Los Alamos and then a two years postdoc, 68 to 70, and I did nothing on nuclear at all. And that was, that was the beauty of Los Alamos. They essentially said, look, why don't you come back? Been here as a summer student. They said, hey, why don't you come back as a postdoc? Uh, you can do whatever you want. You know, we'll, we'll support you. You do whatever you want. Uh, and I thought that was a good deal. You know, besides not only do what I want, but my salary went from $4,800 a year as a graduate student to $12,000 a year. You know, my wife and I thought we sort of died and went to heaven. And in addition, then, they let me do what I wanted to do, and that is to do yield surface work. Uh, so the beauty of Los Alamos, again, was that they had people here who could do anything 
and make anything, measure anything, advise you on any theory, on anything whatsoever. And so I came here uh, and I said, well, look, I need to be able to create um, uh, multi-axial stress states. Uh, and there, the two major ways of doing that is you take thin wall tubes uh, and you either pull them, push them, uh, you can't push them very far because they'll collapse, and then you internally pressurize. And as you internally pressurize, the pull and the push gives you multi-axial stress state. Uh, later on, eventually, we actually went one more step, which is if you can actually add torsion to that as well. Uh, torsion, tension, uh, you know, compression, and internal pressure. But during my postdoc, we, we didn't have a machine that did that. But we did the internal pressure, and so uh, because of the e enormous machining capability we had at Los Alamos at the time, uh, we, we made these intricate samples. Uh, that m machined out of full stock, out of aluminum, uh, copper, and then machined it down to a thin wall. And then I would go ahead and put these in an Instram machine uh, to be able to do tension compression, internally pressurize, put strain gauges on, and then start to load them. Uh, and what I was particularly interested, uh, are there such things as a corner on a yield surface? Uh, so the, the von Mises criterion is an ellipse, it's smooth, and it turns out if you have a smooth yield surface and you load elastically and you get to that yield surface, to that boundary, then the direction of the plastic increment is fully defined. If it has a corner, then there's an ambiguity, it's not defined. And so that could have a lot of impact as to how the plastic flow actually occurs. Uh, and so I spent then a couple of years doing these experiments. It took me maybe not quite six months to actually set up the uh, experimental apparatus, uh, the machining of the tubes. It was actually, again, because of Los Alamos. So we machined these tubes, and I had this super machinist uh, here uh, at Los Alamos by the name of David Murphy. Uh, and, and he was so good in the machining that he did in order not to actually influence the structure in such a terrible way that you could never know what you had. We actually published a paper together, a technical paper, on how you could machine these uh, uh, thin wall tubes. So I did that and then um, uh, went ahead and measured the yield surface and at least convinced myself, and I think a lot of the community, that in most likelihood at the very tiniest level when plastic flow first starts, there actually is a corner on the yield surface. And so you're going to have to deal with that uncertainty. So the, the bottom line then is what I did was to study experimentally, to study the multi-axial flow and particularly to define the yield surfaces in uh, simple materials, you know, like aluminum and copper. After your postdoc at Los Alamos, you spent a period of time working at GM Research Labs. What precipitated that career change and what brought you back to Lanel? So one of the things at Los Alamos at that time, uh, the postdoc was program was set up such uh, that the, the general uh, rule was you do your postdoc and you leave. And so they did not encourage postdocs to stay. Uh, and, and that was probably a good thing because I think I would have been inclined to stay uh, because by the end of my postdoc, we had three kids, three daughters. Uh, and this is beautiful town, beautiful place, great place to raise your kids. Uh, but the general sense of the, of the um, uh, University of California, you know, which of course ran uh, Los Alamos, was you do your postdoc and you move on. So I thought, okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, and, and the first choice uh, was actually at that point then uh, to go university uh, and and go into a professorship line uh, because that's what I really had thought I was going to do in 68. When I got this job offer from University of Illinois uh, and uh, what really kept me, and I was really tempted to do that. You, you know, I was still 24 some years old. I got a job offer to be assistant professor. Uh, that was pretty attractive. Uh, but then uh, that night, when I had dinner with the department chair, he said, Sig, look, I'm going to make you this offer, you know, for assistant professorship. But if you want my advice, fatherly advice, don't take it. He says, go do a postdoc. You know, you could you'd really benefit from a postdoc. You don't have to worry about raising money. You don't have to worry about teaching right away, setting up a lab. Uh, 
Uh, and then two years later, when you're done, I'll still offer you a job. So I said, you can't beat that. That's why I took the Los Alamos postdoc. So then in 70, I looked at Columbia University and Stony Brook. They had openings in mechanical metallurgy. Uh, and, and that was the time when I actually decided, you know, maybe, maybe what I should do, you know, in terms of giving me the best sense of where I want to wind up is actually go into industry. You know, I've had some university uh, exposure by going to school. I've had a national lab exposure at Los Alamos twice, summer and postdoc. And why don't I go uh, into uh, industry? And it turns out at that time, uh, so this is 1970, General Motors was trying to build up uh, its, uh, its technical center and particularly its research laboratory. Uh, until that time, you know, the U.S. used to have superb industrial research laboratories. In, in the metallurgy business, U.S. Steel had the so-called Bain Labs, uh, uh, and uh, there were a number of other places. Alcoa had great laboratories, uh, and the, the, in the auto business, it was Ford that had the best laboratory, called the Ford Scientific Staff. Uh, but by that time, General Motors wanted to build up uh, its capabilities, and so I wound up at General Motors. Uh, and what I did at General Motors then was, and again, they were terrific to me. I mean, essentially, I got every, whatever I wanted in terms of equipment. That's when I got the tension torsion machine. I wanted to still study multi-axial plastic deformation. Uh, but naturally, if you're going to go to work for General Motors, then you have to say, how do you apply that stuff to the mission of the General Motors, which is to build cars? And, and so I really got interested in sheet metal forming. Uh, and so that's when I started to do sheet metal forming research and try to, again, understand the role of, you know, materials properties. And so then I had to expand big time into steels. But that was not, um, that was not all that difficult because case tech, when you went to the you know, metallurgy materials department, you had to know the iron carbon diagram. It was all about steels. That was important. So I went back into steels but then also uh, into aluminum. And so it was a fascinating time. It was right around the time of the first energy crisis uh, and the car companies were worried about gas mileage. Uh, you know, the gas mileage back in those days, if you got an old Buick Super, you know, maybe you got eight miles per gallon. <laughs> you know, so they figured out the best way to get better gas mileage is to make a lighter car. Uh, and it turns out the French had been uh, putting uh, aluminum uh, sheet steel into auto bodies. Uh, and actually had developed some pretty decent uh, aluminum alloys. So I started looking at aluminum alloys. So while I was doing, still doing research on multi-axial uh, plastic flow, uh, I was also helping uh, with the stamping of aluminum uh, car bodies to go into the Vega, which was one of their uh, not so successful products, uh, uh, little automobiles uh, back in the early 1970s. So, so I worked for General Motors, uh, I did a combination uh, of still ongoing, what I would call pretty basic research in the metallurgical world, as well as very applied research going out to uh, the sheet stamping uh, places, which were at that time were called Fisher Body, uh, and work with the Fisher Body people. Uh, and, and that's always, um, I guess as I look back in my career, that's usually where uh, I got my best satisfaction, is sort of a combination of trying to understand things in a pretty fundamental way. Uh, but then also, what do you do with that stuff? You know, how do you apply it? And this was a direct way to apply, you know, that knowledge to how do you make uh, a better uh, automobile body. Or at that time, uh, the other way to reduce weight is that was the development of what are called high-strength, low-alloy steels to go uh, into the structural parts of the cars and so forth, uh, and some uh, of the heavier sheet metal parts and. And so I did, I, I did a bunch of work there uh, at, um, at General Motors and sort of switched the interesting piece, uh, the technical piece. It went from uh, the, the, essentially the yield limits of flow, where you have the elastic to plastic transition, to the transition on the other end, after lots of plastic flow, at some point things either go uh, unstable uh, or they break. Uh, and so then I started dealing with something that I call forming limits. Uh, and so while at General Motors, I was um, uh, developing uh, these ideas for how to determine forming limit curves. Uh, a good uh, colleague of mine at National Steel, by the name of Stuart Keeler, he developed this concept of a forming limit curve. 
Uh, and then while I was at General Motors, I developed uh, some techniques, uh, what I call the simple technique for determining a forming limit curve. Uh, and in fact, the interesting thing today, you know, since today, of course, one has uh, all of these citation indexes and research gate, uh, which I joined a couple of years ago to find out something that I was looking for. So my most cited papers today uh, are still those forming limit papers from General Motors, you know, back in 1972 and 1973. I get at least four or five of those a week. Uh, people are still interested in that stuff. So, so then uh, the interest in at in, in General Motors uh, was sort of the typical industrial materials, uh, you know, namely aluminum, steel, uh, higher strength steel, and so forth. Uh, and then the scientific technical interest was first plasticity uh, and then the issue of large-scale plasticity. And then I came, then I left General Motors. And, and the main reason for leaving General Motors, they, I mean, they, they, were, they were so good to me. Uh, but if you take a look at sort of the anatomy of, of an organization, and, and what I found at General Motors uh, is the people who were really good technically at, at one time, uh, they typically got promoted up into, into management. Uh, there were very few, just a very few people who sort of got old on the job and, and were able to stay technically, scientifically really active. And so there was clearly a push in the management direction. You know, I, I was uh, at that time, you know, I was 28, 29 years old. Uh, they were trying to show me a path towards management, give me a free car to drive, you know, at that age. Uh, and I said, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And so at Los Alamos, they used to call me every six months and said, are you ready to come back yet? The other thing that helped, uh, my wife said, I'm not staying here in the Detroit area. <laughs> and so it was easy uh, to come back to Los Alamos. I came back in uh, end of August, 1973. You said you came back to Lanel in part to avoid the push into management, but of course we know that you became the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory. That wasn't by design, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do for the period of time between coming back to Lanel and... So 1973, I would say, until I took sort of first steps in, into the lower level management position, which was 81, 82 or so, uh, maybe, yeah, so almost 10 years. Uh, that was probably uh, the most productive time of my life uh, here at Los Alamos. Uh, it, it was just fantastic. Uh, and so uh, the areas then had to change somewhat. But, but again, Los Alamos back in those days, uh, was still, uh, let's say, our overall funding was such that uh, that the management had a lot of discretion uh, about what it wanted to fund. Uh, and so it was pretty clear when I came back, um, you know, the management in material science and technology arena, uh, they really wanted me to look at plutonium. Uh, but they also realized, you know, that I'm not going to come back just to look at plutonium because the chances of publishing much of anything uh, in that arena is going to be pretty small. So they essentially said, we'd like you, you know, to look at plutonium and some of our applied problems, but, but you go ahead and you keep doing, you know, what the things that you really enjoy doing. Uh, so I, I continued to study uh, at that time, particularly uh, large plastic flow. And so, so I was really intrigued by large plastic flow in a variety of different materials. Uh, and that's where the interest then comes up with, with trying also uh, to actually model plastic deformation, to worry about the onset of uh, anisotropy uh, and textures and so forth. So that, that opened uh, another area, uh, sort of in this continuing area of mechanical behavior, plasticity, multi-axial stresses, large plastic strains. So I would say that sort of continued the string of things that I was generally interested in. And then I got exposed to, to a whole list of, of other really in, intriguing things, uh, and I, I'll get to it, but eventually the most intriguing of those was plutonium metal, plutonium metallurgy. Uh, but along the way, uh, uh, at Los Alamos, uh, 
Uh, you also had this interest now uh, because of the um, various applications at Los Alamos. So, for example, in the nuclear weapons business, you know, if you look at, first of all, the materials that are in a nuclear weapon, obviously, are pretty exotic things. Uh, and so they could include things like beryllium, for example. The margining steel comes later. Uh, that comes in when you come to uranium enrichment, which is a whole different problem. I didn't do that here uh, at Los Alamos. Uh, but so you get into exotic materials, you know, such as uh, uh, plutonium. Uh, and, then, uh, in a, and then you get into uh, situations of extreme behavior of materials and really extreme. As you might imagine, you, you take these exotic materials and you go ahead and, first of all, you implode them uh, already with high explosive and that does lots of things to them. And, and then, in addition, you know, they wind up blowing up uh, in, a, in a nuclear reaction. Uh, and so, uh, then what you immediately, if you lay out sort of the, um, the space uh, of behavior that you're going to try to map, uh, you obviously, you have multi-axial stresses for sure, uh, but you have high strain rates and shock loading. And so all of a sudden now those issues come into play as to how the materials really behave at high rates of strain and explosive loading. So I became interested uh, in, in that uh, part uh, as well. Uh, you got high temperatures. And so you worry about high temperatures, high rates of loading. You worry about the effect uh, of, um, of radiation. On, on your materials. Again, these set of exotic materials, what does the radiation do to them? Even the intrinsic radiation in something like plutonium, uh, or of course if they're exposed to external radiation. So all of a sudden you define this incredibly complex phase space uh, of, in which you have to understand materials. And to me that was always then the fascinating thing. So, you know, how do you do that? How do you get back to the basics uh, as to how do dislocations, for example, in material really care as to whether they're being hit with a shock wave or whether it's high, high uh, rate or, or low rate. Uh, and then one of the other aspects um, of applications, which I uh, found really, really fascinating and I'd never played with before, uh, and that is essentially the application being nuclear batteries. Uh, and, and what are nuclear batteries? Well, in nuclear batteries, you essentially, you take something uh, that's a heat source, uh, and in this case, that would be plutonium, because of the radiation of plutonium, the alpha radiation, it heats itself. Uh, but ordinary plutonium, that we would call ordinary, the isotope 239, which is the weapons-grade plutonium, uh, it doesn't heat itself very much, and so you wouldn't be able to do much with trying to convert that heat to electricity. Uh, so instead, uh, you use the isotope 238 plutonium. Uh, and 238 plutonium is basically 300 times as alpha active uh, as plutonium 239. And so it produces an enormous amount of heat by its radi radiation uh, and uh, its radioactive decay. And so what one does is you try to take, you ra uh, try to take plutonium 238, uh, use that as a heat source, and then convert that heat to electricity essentially with thermocouples. And, and those become what we call radioisotopic thermoelectric generators. These are the nuclear batteries that we send out into space. So all of the photos you've ever seen of the Saturn rings, uh, of, uh, of Jupiter, uh, of Pluto, all of those, the electricity was provided from these radioisotopic thermoelectric generators. The source of that is plutonium-238. Well, it turns out if you're going to make that big enough, the plutonium-238, to get significant heat to provide the electricity, the plutonium metal would melt itself. And because the melting point of plutonium is 641 degrees Celsius, it would melt itself. So you have to turn it into an oxide, plutonium oxide. Uh, so it becomes a refractory material, yeah, melting point 2400C or so instead of 600C. Uh, and so now you make plutonium oxide. Uh, you mentioned the ceramic society. It's how I got into the ceramic society because all of a sudden you have to understand uh, the behavior uh, of ceramics. Uh, and in this case, I mean, we're working with plutonium 238, which that's pretty hot stuff. Plutonium 239, uh, actually, most of the public doesn't really appreciate that, uh, is, is quite easy to handle uh, because the only reason it's alpha active. Uh, 
uh, the only reason you'd really have to worry about is you, you don't want to breathe it uh, and you don't want to ingest it. Uh, but the alpha radiation is such that it's stopped by your skin. Uh, of course, you don't want to take that chance, so you put it in glove boxes, so it's pretty easy. But the 238 is 300 times as radioactive. That's much more difficult to contain. It's, um, uh, it's also, therefore, uh, much more of a problem if it does escape in a, in a glove box. And what this laboratory did, we, we did all of the 238-related work and then the safety-related work to be able uh, to convince NASA and the regulators that if we put these heat sources, and you know, something about this big, with a lot of plutonium-238 uh, uh, capsules inside, about an inch and a half uh, high and inch plus in, in diameter, maybe inch and a half in diameter, that if we put those uh, on uh, a space mission, that in case that rocket blows up, you know, as it's going off, or in case that rocket, you know, fails to sling around the Earth and gets sent out into outer space and comes into your backyard, how can you assure that you're actually going to be able to survive whatever that impact is and not spread plutonium-238 all over the countryside? Well, that then defined a set of problems uh, that, uh, to me, from a standpoint of, of, you know, my metallurgical materials career, uh, was just absolutely fascinating because now I had to worry about ceramics. Uh, then you have to you have to clad this material. You have to put it in a container. Well, there are not many materials that can withstand so uh, the both the heat and then the chemical uh, you know potential reactions from the plutonium oxide. So it turns out the material of choice is iridium. Uh, iridium you'd think is a nice face is uh, element number seventy seven nice face in a cubic material. But it turns out it's also a strange, strange material. So I started doing iridium. And again, because of the nature of Los Alamos, I was able to study the basic fracture behavior of iridium, the grain boundary and brittle of iridium, or the fact that iridium, even though it's face centered cubic, actually likes to cleave, which is very strange for face centered cubics. But they're very good reasons related to electronic structure. So we had to do that. And then we had excuse for high strain rate. Uh, because if these things go and impact, you know, come back from a, a sort of a mission abort and, and impact, they're going to come in 285 feet per second, up a height, uh, a thermal uh, a spike by re-entering and then uh, re-entering in your backyard. So we and my the colleagues here at, at Los Alamos, uh, they were just fantastic. They had built a gas gun uh, to be able to go ahead and simulate uh, one of those re-entries. Then we had to study the high rate behavior of those materials. And, and that's when uh, I first went to, um, uh, actually it was through a General Motors connection and a person by the name of Sid Green who had left General Motors uh, and went to Salt Lake City to build Hopkins and Bars and, and other equipment. And, and so I went up to uh, Salt Lake City and we bought the first Hopkins and Bar. Uh, and then not long uh, thereafter, we brought in Rusty Gray and, and a couple of other of his colleagues uh, in order to be able to get them to really take a look uh, at high rate deformation, you know, what happens with material, high rate, high temperature. Uh, and eventually, of course, Rusty has then built up the best high rate uh, group, uh, particularly that has to combine sort of metallurgical structure aspects with the mechanical deformation and fracture. Uh, he built the best group anywhere in, in the world. But so that got us into high rate, into iridium. We had to worry about graphite, graphite composites, because you had to build an impact shell in order to put these things in. So ceramics, iridium, graphite composites, high rates, high temperatures, uh, all of those things. Then eventually plutonium. It's clear you've sought out difficult problems. You started working on steels, which is something that's widely considered to be a very complex phase diagram in, in industry, and worked on things like various uranium alloys, plutonium, something so complex that you worked with the Russians after the Cold War to try to reconcile the differences between our two phase diagrams for plutonium. Was plutonium the most challenging system that you've worked on as a metallurgist? Oh, without question. Yeah, yeah without question. Uh, in fact, uh, what, what I didn't mention specifically, there was yet one other application that I was drawn to. Uh, 
that had its own related problems. That actually drew me into the uranium work. Um, that there were certainly uranium-related challenges also in the general nuclear weapons program. Uh, but the more fascinating uranium challenges were actually with what we called advanced conventional munitions. Uh, and so you would ask, well, what are advanced conventional munitions? Uh, one of them is uh, what I call long rod penetrators. Uh, and, um, and it turns out uh, some of my colleagues here at Los Alamos had developed the uranium alloys that are best for long rod penetrators. And then there were other people here at Los Alamos, because Los Alamos, as you might imagine, is really good with explosives. Uh, so uh, they had developed a, a, a different concept of what are called shape charge liners. Uh, and the shape charge liner essentially is a trunk of metal. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, their innovation was to take a hemisphere, and so a thin walled hemisphere uh, a material, uh, put explosives behind it, a column of explosive, light off the explosive, it takes that thin wall and turns it inside out, essentially extrudes it inside out, and has a penetrating metal jet. And that metal jet is the deadliest thing to penetrate anything in the world. And they found out that uranium is the best of those liners. Typically, people had used copper. Uranium is better. Uh, and then, where my sheet metal forming work came in, uh, they came to me and said, hey, look, we have this one particular grade of uranium, and it works better than anything that we've ever tried, but we don't know why. Uh, and so I went back to my General Motors days and started doing all the testing, the tensile testing. And in the end, that led me to understanding that it was the texture of that uranium. It was actually the texture that made it go that well. And what I mean by penetration is that jet is able to penetrate what we call rolled homogeneous armor, one meter of rolled homogeneous armor just right through. So again, you, t you talk about fascinating material challenges. I'm not sure that, that I looked them up. They sort of looked me up. <laughs> so those challenges, you know, somebody comes and says, hey, we don't understand this uranium alloy. But anyway, so, so back um, uh, to plutonium. So I started working uh, with the Russians, uh, not because of the plutonium uh, at all. And so that's actually, that's a, it's a long, complicated story, because by this time, uh, I was out of the laboratory. Uh, and then actually, by the time we did the first, by the time I did the first real detailed work with the Russians on the plutonium phase diagram, I was not only out of the laboratory, I was also out of the directorship. <laughs> you know, because in 1986, uh, I got into the Los Alamos directorship. And so I was in, I was Los Alamos director from, January of 1986 through uh, November uh, of, uh, of 1997. Uh, and, and then I left the directorship and sort of went back uh, to staff. Uh, and so I did, and that's when I started then again going back into the plutonium world. Uh, but by that time, during my directorship, uh, the uh, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, you know, Russia was reborn. Uh, and for a variety of other reasons besides uh, metallurgy, uh, I began to work very, very closely uh, with the Russians uh, uh, over the years. And, and it was developing the relationship with the Russians related to security issues, security of their nuclear weapons, security of their nuclear materials, security of their nuclear facilities, uh, questions about export, uh, and security of their people. Uh, that then eventually, uh, so from uh, 1992, when I first went over to Russia, uh, until 1998, when I met uh, their senior uh, plutonium metallurgist, uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Lydia Timofeva. Uh, so it, it was the rest of the work that we did together uh, that allowed us to get sufficient trust and knowledge of each other uh, where we were able to tackle the uh, obviously pretty sensitive issue of, of plutonium, and we did.